In my previous life, my wife suddenly had a heart attack and was taken to the hospital by a colleague. By the time I arrived at the hospital, my wife had already passed away. I couldn't accept this blow and fainted. When I woke up again, my wife had already been cremated. There was no time to grieve as debt collectors came knocking on my door. Only then did I find out that my wife had accumulated millions in loans, and I was the sole heir according to her will. Ten years later, I was hunched over, picking up trash on the streets. I saw my wife, who was supposed to be dead, driving a luxury car and laughing with her first love. She smiled and threw down a hundred dollar bill, thanking me for my efforts. My body had long been worn out from exhaustion, and I died on the spot from anger. When I opened my eyes again, I had returned to the day my wife had a heart attack. Chapter 1 Brother-in-law You need to restrain your grief and take care of yourself. We did our best to save her, but Sister Melissa still, Gloria, Melissa's best friend and attending physician, spoke regretfully, using some medical terms I didn't understand. She helped me sit on the sofa. Brother-in-law, you better not look. I'm afraid you can't bear it. I looked at my still youthful self in the glass opposite, without the scars from long-term labor on my hands. After taking a few deep breaths, I finally confirmed my rebirth. In my previous life, when I received the news of Melissa Wu's heart attack, I rushed to the hospital, running three red lights along the way but still arrived a step too late, holding the death certificate. I regretted it endlessly, banging my head against the wall, blaming myself for not personally taking Melissa to work. Maybe it was the excessive grief, or maybe it was from banging my head. I fainted in the hospital. When I woke up, Melissa had already been cremated, leaving me with only a small urn of ashes. I hugged the urn at home, refusing to eat or drink, but what came instead were several lawyers with major loan companies knocking on my door. It was only then that I found out I was the sole heir in Melissa's will. I struggled to get a grip on the financial situation. I discovered that Melissa's company had been sold by my mother-in-law, Laura, leaving me with millions in loans. The house was soon forcibly auctioned by the court. I had nowhere to go, and when I sought help from Laura, she refused to see me. The following days were extremely difficult. I lived in a small shed, with debt collectors coming to my door almost every day to survive and repay the debt. I worked four jobs daily, but even after court enforcement, I could barely make ends meet and had to endure illnesses without treatment. Until one day, while picking up trash, I saw Melissa, who had been dead for 10 years, driving a car and laughing with her first love. I rushed up to take a closer look. Melissa made no effort to hide her identity, mocking me for looking 70 at 40, and threw me a hundred dollar bill, thanking me for my efforts over the past 10 years. I died on the spot from anger. While Melissa drove away as if she hadn't seen anything, thinking of this, I made a decision. In my previous life, you faked your death. This time, I will make you truly dead. Chapter 2 Gloria kept urging me to drink water, but I came to my senses and didn't drink it, because I remembered that in my previous life, I fainted after drinking this glass of water. I was almost 100% sure there was something in it to make me miss Melissa's cremation. I put down the glass of water and walked to Melissa's bedside. Ignoring Gloria's obstruction, although I lifted the sheet, Melissa's face was rosy, and her breathing looked smooth. It was only in my previous life that I was too sad and too foolish to notice this. I raised my hand and slapped Melissa's face hard. Melissa didn't move an inch. It seemed she was afraid I would find out, so she was directly anesthetized. This was even better for my plan. Gloria screamed, thinking I had discovered Melissa was pretending, brother-in-law. You, you can't be so harsh even if you're angry. We can explain everything. Thinking of the pain in my previous life, my anger surged, but I didn't stop hitting Melissa hard all over her body. Seeing Gloria on the verge of breaking down, I acted like I hated Melissa for not living up to my expectations. I told you not to stay up late, to get a checkup. Why didn't you listen to me? What am I supposed to do now that you left me alone? Gloria thought I hadn't discovered anything believing I was just expressing my grief through hitting. But seeing how harshly I was hitting, she was a bit worried, stammering. Brother-in-law, take it easy. Sister Melissa will feel pain. I stopped, looking at Gloria like she was an idiot. Why? Gloria, do newly dead people feel pain? Gloria swallowed, regretting her words, and awkwardly forced a smile. No, I just... She couldn't finish her sentence. Not wanting to argue with her, I directly took out my phone and dialed a number. Yes. I want to donate organs here. Just died recently. Come quickly. Gloria wanted to stop me, but due to her position, she quickly took out her phone and sent a message. Chapter 3. 
The people from the organ donation office arrived within minutes. I put on a sorrowful expression. My wife was always a kind person. With this unexpected death, I hope her life can continue by saving more people. The doctor from the donation office shook my hand firmly. I thank you on behalf of those families. May I ask which organs you want to donate? I glanced at Gloria and sighed. My wife died of a sudden heart attack. I'm not sure which organs can still be donated. Just perform an autopsy and see. If there are no usable organs, then donate her body for medical research. Gloria blocked the bed. No, brother-in-law. Melissa didn't want to donate her organs. She told me this before. We must respect her wishes. I wiped away my tears. Gloria, I am Melissa's husband. I can make this decision. You and Melissa are just good friends without blood ties. We both know who has the final say here. Besides, every minute you delay means more organ deterioration. You're a doctor too. Don't you want to save lives? Yes. Dr. Gloria, please step aside. The organ donation staff echoed. Gloria refused to move. I just contacted Aunt Wu. You should at least let her see Melissa one last time. So she had informed Laura. I nodded in agreement. I never intended to donate Melissa's organs because I knew she would be discovered alive as soon as her chest was opened. My goal wasn't to expose her fake death instead. I want Melissa to make the fake play turn real. I did all this simply to force out Victor. Or maybe Laura. I wanted them to see Melissa die with their own eyes, powerless to stop it. This would also serve as evidence against them if they ever tried to frame me in the future. Chapter 4 Laura rushed in, with curlers still in her hair, indicating she was at the salon. She sighed with relief seeing Melissa still intact on the bed. Then she slapped me. What's the use of you? What bad luck did Melissa have to marry you? My daughter died because of you, and you still want to dissect her? If anyone touches a hair on my daughter's head today, I'll kill their whole family. Laura forcefully drove the organ donation staff away. No donations. No donations. Go harm someone else. The organ donation staff left reluctantly, having no choice. Gloria breathed a sigh of relief and covered Melissa with a white cloth. Laura sat on the sofa and continued to curse me. You worthless scum. Your wife is dead. And instead of mourning and burying her, you want to use her for medical research? Do you still want to be a silent teacher? You want to cut my daughter into pieces. If you want to be a good person, donate yourself. You can die now, and I'll donate all of you. Holding my face, I sighed heavily. Mom, I'm sorry. I was just trying to. Before I could finish, Laura slapped me again. Don't even think about it. Now, go back. I'll take my daughter to the crematorium later. I fell silent, kneeling on the floor, humbly handing the water Gloria had brought me to Laura. Laura, not suspecting anything. Drank it in one gulp due to her dry mouth from all the yelling. Gloria didn't have time to stop her. Within minutes of drinking, Laura fell asleep. Cold sweat immediately broke out on Gloria's face again. She stammered, Brother-in-law, you're not thinking of donating organs again, are you? Chapter 5 I shook my head and laid Laura flat on the sofa. Of course not. Mom said no, so I won't continue. Gloria sighed in relief. Aunt Wu suddenly fainting might not be a good sign. You should take her to the emergency room quickly. I'll arrange for Sister Melissa's cremation myself. How can that be? It's not right to trouble you with this. You're a doctor and know more than I do. You should take care of my mother while I handle the cremation. With that, I contacted the crematorium and asked them to come immediately. Gloria tried to argue. There's no rush for the cremation. Let's wait until Aunt Wu wakes up. Sister Melissa isn't going anywhere. I replied. Gloria. Melissa is already dead. The living are more important than the dead. You and Melissa were as close as sisters. But today you're not even sad and keep saying strange things. What exactly do you want? Gloria was frantic, like a cat on a hot tin roof, trying desperately to wake Laura. But Laura remained unconscious. By the time the crematorium staff had taken Melissa away, Gloria couldn't hold back any longer. She grabbed my sleeve, her voice hoarse, brother-in-law. I, I think I just saw Sister Melissa move. Let's try to save her. I held the death certificate in front of Gloria. Gloria, think carefully before you speak. Have you considered the consequences if Melissa is actually alive? What responsibility would your hospital bear? And what responsibility would you bear? This is called murder. This is recklessly disregarding human life. I don't know if the hospital can continue operating, but you would definitely go to prison. So think again. Did you really see Melissa move? Gloria was at her wit's end and had no way to refute me. I sneered and shook off her hand, following the crematorium's car. Gloria let out a cry and started making phone calls. Chapter 6 I looked at Melissa lying on the stretcher and couldn't help but laugh. In my previous life, 
when I met Melissa on the street. Although ten years had passed, her face looked almost the same, with hardly any signs of aging. I threw myself in front of the car, wanting to recognize her, wanting to see if it was really Melissa, wanting to express my longing for her over the years. Melissa squinted her eyes and took a long time to barely recognize me, laughing. It's you. How come after just ten years, you look older than my grandfather? At that time, my voice was hoarse, and I was hunched over, indeed not looking like a fifty-year-old. I stuttered. You, you weren't dead? Melissa and Victor, who was sitting next to her, laughed heartily. I faked my death to get rid of you. Although Melissa didn't finish her sentence, what else was there for me to not understand? If she had asked for a divorce directly, I couldn't have refused. But a direct divorce would have meant splitting her assets with me and gaining a reputation as a cheating woman. Faking her death was different. It not only left all the debts to me but also allowed her to transfer all assets and boldly be with Victor under a new identity. I was too angry to speak, while Melissa seemed eager to continue mocking me. Actually, at the hospital, I could hear you talking. I still haven't forgotten how you cried. I'm really curious how a man can cry like a goose. It's really funny. Ha 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 ha. Amidst her mocking laughter, I clutched my chest and collapsed. Victor exclaimed, Wife, she's not trying to scam us, is she? Let's go quickly. Melissa also shouted about bad luck and drove away, not caring about my life or death. My last memory was watching the car drive away before everything went dark. Chapter 7 I was still immersed in painful memories when I noticed Melissa's fingers seemed to move slightly. It looked like she realized she was about to be cremated, and the anesthesia was wearing off, causing her to start waking up. I urged the driver to go faster. Driver, please hurry up. My mother-in-law is trying to take my wife's body to donate it. I just want my wife to leave and come back whole. The driver acknowledged and stepped on the gas increasing the speed significantly. I leaned down on Melissa's chest, listening to her steady heartbeat, and said everything I didn't have the chance to say in my previous life. I know you're not dead. I also know you've been cheating and staged this whole act to run away with Victor, leaving me to pay the debts. But I don't hate you. I've decided to respect your wish. Since you want to die, I'll make sure you get cremated as soon as possible. I know you can hear me now, but I'm not sure if you can feel pain. I hope you can so you can experience the cremation. After all, you might be the first person to be cremated alive. You might be wondering why I'm doing this or how I know all this. It doesn't matter now because I've lived through today once before. In my previous life, I believed you as you wished and lived a miserable life. So don't blame me. You owe me this. Melissa's fingers trembled slightly. She couldn't move, but tears started streaming down her face. I wiped away her tears. Already crying? You'll have plenty of time to cry once you're in the crematorium. My phone kept ringing non-stop. It was calls from Gloria and Laura. But right now, I was just a grieving man who had lost his wife and had no intention of answering the calls. Chapter 8 Thanks to the driver's speeding, we arrived at the crematorium in 20 minutes, a trip that usually took half an hour. However, there were many people at the crematorium today, and it would be at least an hour before it was Melissa's turn. I walked around frantically before finding the person in charge. My wife died suddenly of a heart attack. My mother-in-law fainted upon hearing the news and is now being resuscitated in the hospital. I need to get back to her quickly. Please, let me cremate my wife first. I don't want my mother-in-law to suffer too. The crematorium staff had never encountered someone wanting to cut in line for cremation. He hesitated. I understand you're in a hurry, but others have been waiting too. It's not fair to let you cut in line, despite his words. He subtly extended his hand, indicating he wanted money. Knowing time was of the essence, I took out my phone and transferred him 2,000 yuan. Please help me out. I'm an orphan. My wife and mother-in-law have been very good to me. I can't lose my mother-in-law too, with the added incentive. Melissa successfully cut the line and was pushed into the cremation chamber within 10 minutes. Just as the staff was about to press the incineration button, I stopped him. I couldn't let him become an accomplice, and I wanted to take my revenge personally. After my strong insistence, the staff agreed to let me press the button. At that moment, Laura and Gloria's anxious voices echoed from the entrance. Stop. Stop. Don't cremate her. Laura, possibly still under the influence of medication or from the shock, collapsed at the entrance. Stop. Bring my daughter out. Gloria grabbed my hand as I was about to press the incineration button. Brother-in-law. Wait. Aunt Wu has something to say to Melissa. Laura, panting heavily, shouted. Get out. I won't let you cremate my daughter. I'll do it myself. You, take her out. At this critical moment, they still wanted to continue their fake death plan. I knelt down, speaking sorrowfully, 
Mom, Melissa is gone. Let's let her rest in peace. I am Melissa's husband. I won't leave. Our argument drew the attention of many onlookers. The staff, puzzled, said, What kind of tragic play is this? The crematorium is no place for this nonsense. He then moved to press the incineration button. Gloria and Laura, desperate, lunged forward to stop him. Their faces twisted with desperation. The staff, startled, instinctively stepped aside. Gloria and Laura, unable to stop their momentum, fell onto the button, and flames instantly engulfed Melissa. Chapter 9. Ah! Ah! Two screams echoed, and everyone looked at Gloria and Laura, but I kept my eyes fixed on Melissa inside the crematorium. The anesthesia on Melissa must have completely worn off. I vaguely saw her mouth open and her hand stretch out, but unfortunately, the commotion outside was too loud, and no one noticed. It was only after a minute that everyone turned back to look at the crematorium. The crematorium staff pointed at the crematorium in amazement, whispering, This is the first time I've seen a hand reach so high. It really looks like a living person. Yeah, usually there's only a slight muscle reaction. It's a good thing it's daytime. Otherwise, I'd think it was a ghost. I wiped away non-existent tears and tried not to let my lips curl up. Speaking pitifully, my wife loved her mother-in-law the most. She must have heard her mother-in-law's voice and tried to sit up to see her one last time. I wiped my eyes and said to the crematorium, Rest in peace, my dear wife. Don't worry, I will take good care of mom and make sure she joins you soon. Coincidentally, as I said this, Melissa's hand fell back down, seemingly dead for good. I breathed a sigh of relief and it felt like the suffering from my past life had vanished. Gloria, ignoring the collapsed Laura, stumbled over and was horrified by what she saw inside the crematorium. She desperately pressed the incineration button. Why won't the fire stop? Put it out. The staff, seeing such a distressed family member for the first time, quickly pushed Gloria aside. We understand you're grieving, but the dead cannot come back to life. Acting like this won't bring her peace. That's right. And this is an automated crematorium. Once it starts, it has to burn completely before it can be opened. Please, calm down. Chapter 10. Gloria, pale as a ghost, collapsed onto the floor, muttering, It's over. It's all over. Then she looked at me. Brother-in-law, why didn't you answer your phone when we called you? I sighed. I was too distraught to answer any calls. All I could think about was what to do now that Melissa is gone. Besides, Cremation after death is a normal procedure. Why were you trying to stop it? Laura crawled to my feet. You bastard. You killed my daughter. Give me back my daughter's life. I sighed again, but didn't help Laura up. Instead, I held up the death certificate. Mom, I know you're upset, but Melissa's death has nothing to do with me. She died of a sudden heart attack, not because of anything I did. If you don't believe me, Ask Gloria. She was the one who tried to save Melissa and issued this death certificate. Isn't that right, Gloria? I turned to look at Gloria. Gloria was at a loss for words. Should she say Melissa wasn't dead? Then how did the death certificate come about? Say Melissa was dead? Laura wouldn't believe it. Seeing my point, Laura suddenly grabbed Gloria's throat. It was you. You killed my daughter. She was alive. And you issued a death certificate. Now she's been cremated. This is all your fault. Feigning shock, I covered my mouth. What? Mom, what are you saying? Melissa wasn't dead? I quickly turned to look at Melissa, still being cremated. No wonder I thought I saw her fingers move when she entered the crematorium. I thought it was just my imagination. I can't believe it was real. Chapter 11 Upon hearing my words, Gloria pulled her hair desperately and, after much mental preparation, finally spoke. It's true. Melissa isn't dead. She was just anesthetized. If you had waited a few more minutes, she would have woken up. I still felt the need to escalate things. What? Are you saying Melissa was cremated alive and conscious? This statement was horrifying, and everyone present was stunned. The staff's faces turned pale as they muttered. No wonder. Just after I started the fire, she suddenly reached out her hand. My God, this, this is murder. Hearing this, Laura rolled her eyes and fainted. I quickly reacted slapping Gloria across the face. Gloria, are you insane? How can you joke about something like this? My wife is dead, and you're making up lies. Gloria, shocked by the slap, stammered, I'm not lying. I sneered, not lying? Then tell me, why was my wife anesthetized? Why did you issue a death certificate? If you're going to lie, at least make it plausible. Gloria didn't know how to explain, and the surrounding staff, hearing this, thought she was joking and went back to their work. 
As Melissa's cremation concluded, I angrily left the crematorium with her ashes. Before leaving, I told Gloria, you scared mom into fainting for no reason, you take her to the hospital. It wasn't that I didn't want to stay and see Laura's reaction upon waking, but I had more important matters to attend to. Chapter 12 I placed Melissa's ashes prominently in the living room. Then I quickly contacted a lawyer to start the process of inheriting Melissa's company and estate. In my previous life, I was too grief-stricken. By the time I came to my senses, the company was gone. If I didn't act quickly in this life, Laura would surely seize control once she woke up. I couldn't waste the second chance. After completing the paperwork, I contemplated the millions in debt. Knowing Melissa, she wouldn't have given all that money to Victor or Laura, but I had already checked, and there was no such money in her name. So, she must have hidden it. Following Melissa's spending records, I found a garage she had rented. Following the address, I found the cash hidden there. I quickly contacted the bank and loan companies, paying off part of the interest and settling the loans. With everything done, I lay on the sofa, holding a glass of red wine, and smiled at Melissa's photo on the wall. Thank you, dear wife. Now I have money, a house, and a company, with no debts. I'll live a carefree life even better than in your previous life. I drank heavily and fell asleep on the sofa. The next morning, I was awakened by a knock on the door. Rubbing my aching head, I opened the door. Outside stood Gloria and Laura, accompanied by a man who looked a few years older. It was Victor, looking angry and holding a six- or seven-year-old boy who resembled Melissa. Was this a child born before our marriage? No wonder Melissa refused to have children after we married. She had already had one with her first love. The three of them looked sorrowful and had dark circles under their eyes, probably from several sleepless nights. They were followed by a few police officers. Chapter 13 Laura walked into the house, pointing at me. Officer, this man cremated my daughter alive. Arrest him and cremate him too, so he knows what it feels like. I had anticipated this drama, but I didn't expect it to come so quickly. I sighed. Mom, can you stop making such jokes? I took out the death certificate. Officer. This is my wife's death certificate. My mom couldn't handle the loss and might have some mental issues. The officer looked at the death certificate. Boom. This seems fine. I sighed again. My wife and I were married for three years, and our relationship was very strong. When she passed away, I didn't want her body to decay, so I cremated her immediately. Was that wrong? Laura clutched her chest. You're lying. My daughter despised you long ago. If Victor hadn't been unable to divorce back then, Melissa would never have married you out of spite. You did it on purpose. You cremated her out of turn just to get her inheritance in company. I confirmed it with the company yesterday. What else do you have to say? I looked incredulous, my eyes red with tears. Mom, you can insult me, but my love for Melissa was real. If we had no feelings for each other, why would she make me the sole heir of her estate? Laura couldn't refute this, so I continued. You say Melissa was still alive. How could such a large hospital fail to determine if a person is dead or alive? Gloria told me herself that Melissa was brain dead and her heart had stopped. What living person is like that? Chapter 14 Laura signaled Gloria to speak, but Gloria kept her head down. It made sense. If she admitted the death certificate was fake, the consequences would be severe. It was better to stick with the lie. The situation reached a deadlock. Victor tugged on Laura's sleeve and she stopped talking. He sighed, Melissa really wasn't dead. I'm Melissa's boyfriend. We broke up years ago due to a misunderstanding, and she married you out of spite. I recently got divorced and came with my child to find Melissa. She realized she still loved me and wanted to fake her death to leave you. But you cremated her. Victor hesitated. But don't blame Melissa. She did it not to hurt you. She was a kind person. Now that Melissa is gone. We just hope you can accept this child and give him the inheritance he deserves. I took a sip of water and mimicked Laura's tone. You're lying. Then I sadly turned to Laura. Mom, I know you didn't get along with Melissa. She didn't leave you anything in her will. So you brought this child to frame Melissa and claim her inheritance. Isn't that right? Laura was almost driven to madness by my words. But for the sake of money, she held back. You're lying. I got along very well with Melissa. This is her child. I'm absolutely sure. I took out Melissa's will. Mom, why are you lying? If you got along well with Melissa, why isn't your name in her will? Why did she leave everything to me? Laura was speechless. Victor hesitated. He couldn't exactly say that Melissa made me her heir to saddle me with debts. Chapter 15 
I glanced at the child standing behind Victor and smirked inwardly. So that's why my wife, who had pretended to be good for three years, suddenly stopped pretending because her first love and son came back. However, I didn't feel sad since I'd already died once. I said calmly, you claim this child is Melissa's. Then please provide evidence, such as a legally recognized paternity test or a birth certificate. Victor and Laura were taken aback. There's no paternity test because the child was born at home, so there's no birth certificate. But he is Melissa's child. I waved my hand. Officer, do you see what's happening here? They know my wife has been cremated and brought a child to claim the inheritance. They even falsely accuse me of cremating my wife alive. Their statements are completely contradictory. Laura, anxious, said, I can take a DNA test with the child to prove I am his grandmother, which would indirectly prove he's Melissa's child. The officer shook his head. That won't suffice. It only proves you are related to the child, but it doesn't establish Melissa's relation to the child. Even if it did, it wouldn't prove that Melissa was your only child. I held back my laughter. Part of the reason I insisted on cremating Melissa quickly was to avoid such situations. It turned out to be the right move. Laura and Victor exchanged glances, and Victor gritted his teeth. It doesn't matter whose child it is. Melissa wasn't dead. He cremated her alive. He's a murderer. He can't inherit Melissa's estate. Victor was right about that. But he needed to prove I was a murderer first. Chapter 16. I suddenly looked at Gloria. Gloria, tell us. Was Melissa dead or alive? You're a doctor with a family. Think carefully before you speak. You may not remember, but I do. It was you and mom who pressed the incineration button. If Melissa was alive, then you two are the murderers. I turned their actions of trying to stop the cremation into pressing the button on purpose. Laura didn't even have time to call me a liar. Gloria gritted her teeth, avoiding Laura and Victor's gaze. She was really dead. I breathed a sigh of relief, but Victor raised his phone. I suspected you'd lie, so I brought evidence. Victor played a video on his phone, showing him, Melissa, Gloria, and Laura sitting on a couch, discussing the fake death plan. Melissa's voice, as disgusting as in my previous life, came from the phone. I'll get anesthetized. You find a way to knock out my husband and tell him I've been cremated. I'll give you a million once it's done. The video wasn't complete and didn't include the part where they discussed making me shoulder the debts. Gloria crouched down at a loss for words. I, I didn't know. Victor seemed relieved. I wasn't lying. You killed Melissa, so you should go to jail. The inheritance should go to Auntie. I acted frightened and didn't speak, brewing my emotions to appear genuinely sad, not pretending. Officer, I want to report them. These three planned my wife's fake death without telling me. I was devastated and didn't notice she was alive. I pointed at Gloria and Laura. They knew I planned to donate my wife's organs and cremate her. But they didn't tell me she wasn't dead. They did it on purpose. So I would unknowingly cremate my wife and then come to claim the inheritance. Chapter 17. I asked Laura and Victor. I knew my wife had passed away. So I followed the normal procedure to cremate her. Was that wrong? Clearly, it wasn't. They hadn't expected me to speak so clearly. They thought I'd break down upon learning the truth and be easily manipulated. But I had already died once. I was no longer the naive and foolish person I was in my previous life. From the moment I woke up, I knew exactly how I would handle each step ahead. With a choked voice, I continued. I wanted to donate her organs. Mom, you were there. Why didn't you tell me the truth when you refused? If it was just about a divorce, why wouldn't I agree? You deceived Melissa, made her believe your lies, and chose to fake her death. Then you deliberately cremated Melissa making me the villain who sent his own wife to the crematorium. How cruel can you be? Laura stammered. Melissa insisted that you must believe it. So I had to stop the organ donation and couldn't tell you the truth. I took out my phone. Then what about this? You called me on my way to the crematorium, proving you knew I was going to cremate Melissa. I was too heartbroken to answer. But why didn't you send a message? When I got to the crematorium, Melissa hadn't been cremated yet. Why didn't you tell me the truth then? Instead. You caused a scene and pressed the incineration button yourselves? Laura and Gloria were speechless, but I knew they were confident they had time. They thought they could distract me at the crematorium and still succeed. Desperation breeds bold moves. This drama ended without a conclusion, each side standing firm. The police took us all to the station for temporary detention pending investigation. Chapter 18 After a few days of investigation, the police found out that I was indeed a simple husband, unaware of Melissa's affair. I never questioned Melissa's business trips, social engagements, or checked her phone. Neighbors, 
friends, and colleagues confirmed that we were a loving couple, with no signs of discord. The home surveillance showed no arguments between us. The police couldn't know I'd been reborn. Based on the evidence, how could such a loving husband kill his wife? Laura, Gloria, and Victor's statements were full of holes. They had countless opportunities to tell me Melissa wasn't dead but waited until after the cremation, especially Gloria and Laura, who saw Melissa enter the crematorium but still didn't speak up, even pressing the button themselves. They claimed it was unintentional. But who would believe that? Not only that, the initial fake death incident was already extremely alarming. Thus, the investigation concluded that I was an innocent, grieving husband while the other three were charged with attempted murder. Six months later, they were found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. Laura wasn't so fortunate. She died of a heart attack upon hearing her sentence. Gloria's husband divorced her and left with their children, devastated by her actions. Rumor has it Gloria attempted suicide several times in prison but failed each time. As for Victor, he contacted me several times, begging me to visit him in prison. When I ignored him, he started writing letters pleading with me to raise the child for Melissa's sake. I sent him a letter back, informing him that the child had been sent to an orphanage. I am no saint. I couldn't raise the child of someone who conspired to kill my wife. I then sold the house and used the inheritance Melissa left me to buy a larger, better located property. I kept Melissa's ashes with me, believing that if there is an afterlife, she would see how happy I am now.